yeah, I don't, I think it'll have to be you, Sarah. <laughs> I started it already. Oh, okay, perfect. That's interesting. It didn't pop up at me, but hi guys. Welcome. I see some folks coming in slowly, but surely. Hope everyone's doing great this Tuesday evening. We're excited to have you guys. And in the chat, if you guys want to go ahead and um, let us know where you're uh, joining us from, we'd love to hear that. And you can do that in the chat option. We'd love to hear where you're from. Nice to see we have some local folks, nice. We know it's been a while since you've probably joined us for Discovery Lab. We're excited to have you guys back for the fall. We have a good one to start the fall off, so. Okay, we got some people from North Carolina and Georgia, even though they're from the area. Nice to see you guys, welcome. We'll give it another, about another minute for some folks to join us before we get started this evening. And also in the chat, if you guys want to put if this is your first Discovery Lab that you've attended, we'd love to hear that too. Or if you're a returner, we love to see that. Awesome, we have some first timers, that's great. Yes, yeah, so if you're not familiar, usually our discovery labs are in person, but due to safety protocols, um, we have been doing them virtually over the past year. And we're gonna continue that um, for the next couple of months and see what happens. So definitely stay tuned um, about discovery labs in the future, but we're excited to still have you guys join us today, even if it is virtual. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started since it is six o'clock. Um, so welcome everyone. My name is Tara. I am an education, um, marine education specialist at the Chesapeake Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. And joining me, we have Sarah Nuss, our education coordinator, and Matthew. He is another marine education specialist. And our speaker, Dr. Robert Isdell, will be our guest speaker this evening. Um, but we just have a couple of announcements for you guys. So this isn't the only Discovery Lab we'll be having this fall. We will have a September and an October Discovery Lab. So those dates are listed on the slide here. Again, at 6 o'clock p.m. At the moment, they are still going to be virtual. Um, so most likely the October one as well will be virtual, but stay tuned. Um, and those topics for September is going to be lobsters. And then for October, we're doing Mad Lab, specifically talking about bioluminescence. And we'll be doing a bunch of really cool experiments um, that relate to bioluminescence in our ocean. And to stay in touch with us, you can follow us on our social media platforms. We have our Facebook page. Um, so that's listed there along with our Instagram account and our Twitter account. So we're announcing um, any kind of educational programs, announcements about our future discovery labs. And if you're just interested in what CBNIR does on a day-to-day -day basis, we're always posting to those uh, platforms. So definitely check us out and um, tag us or um, follow us so you can definitely stay in the loop about what's going on with CB Near. And so for this evening's Discovery Lab, we will begin with Dr. Robert Isdell's um, sorry, presentation about wetlands, so why they're important. He's going to talk about some of the research he has done. We will do a Q&A session so you guys can ask some questions for him. Um, you can use the Q&A um, at the top of your screen or the bottom of your screen, and um, we'll feed him those questions for him to answer, okay? And then we will play a little game called Wetland Who, so a little interactive game for you guys to play with us, and we're ending the night with a lot of people's favorite, Wetlands Trivia, so um, pay attention to some of 
what he's going to be discussing because it might pop up in our trivia tonight. Um, and so with that, I do want to introduce our guest speaker. So Dr. Robert Isdell works here at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. Um, his background is very extensive. He's um, gotten his bachelor's down in North Carolina, traveled back up here for his master's and his PhD, and has been working at VIMS ever since. And I'll let him give a little more introduction about his, his role and um, what he does here at VIMS. Um, and so again, you guys, if you have any questions throughout his talk, you can leave it in that Q&A section on your Zoom screen. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Isdell. Hi, Tara, thank you. And hello, everyone. Thank you all for joining in. Um, I am excited to talk to you all today about wetlands. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can see what I see and what I want to show you. Um, hopefully, everyone can, can see that now. Looks good. Um, I'm just going to turn on my spotlight so I can point to things when I need to. Um, I'll do that later. So, uh, Hello again. Uh, so I'm Robert Isdell. I am a coastal ecologist with the Center for Coastal Resources Management here at VIMS. Um, and so for those of you who might not be familiar I am uh, with what a coastal ecologist is, I am an ecologist that works along the coast. But, um, but what does an ecologist do? So what, what ecologists study is the uh, interface between humans and the environment um, and how plants and animals interact with the, uh, with the environment around them. So both the physical and the natural world. Um, so how does all of this come together and, and interact? Um, and so those are the things that I like to study and I particularly like to study how those interactions occur along the shoreline. Um, so where the water meets the land. Um, and, and so we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that area in, in great detail today because it's all about wetlands. Um, so, so let's jump in um, and yeah, please uh, ask questions as we go along. Um, I will definitely answer them at the end. Let's see if I can, I'm going to bring up the uh, chat panel and the Q&A just off to the side so that if something comes up as I'm going along, maybe I can answer it um, in the moment. But, but yeah, let's dive in. So the first thing that I want to do is show you all a video. And so um, I am in a small part copying out. Um, I had a, a good friend and colleague a few years ago put together this, this video on wetlands. Um, and she did just such a fantastic job going through all the different types of wetlands and, and displaying it in such a, an easy to see and understand way that I really want to show you all this video first. Um, and then we'll, we'll get a little more in depth after that, but let's kick off with this video by um, friend and colleague, Dr. Pamela Braff. What makes the wetland a wetland? The simplest answer is water. Wetlands are found throughout the world wherever the wind and water match. There are many different types of wetlands, but a wetland is not a puddle, nor is it a lake, pond, stream, or river. And while water is certainly important, wetlands are also defined by their soils and plants. Wetlands are areas of land saturated with water. This means that wetlands hold and absorb water similar to the sun, but not all wetlands are always saturated. The movement of water to and from a wetland is known as its hydrology. While some wetlands are almost always underwater, others are rarely flooded. Many people think of wetlands as muddy, but wetlands can often look dry for much of the year. So all wetlands are wet, but not all wetlands are always wet. Wetlands also have hybrid soils. These are frequently flooded or saturated soils. Most non-wetland soils are full of oxygen, but in hydric soils, water replaces this oxygen changing the soil chemistry. Did you know this is why wetlands often smell like rotten eggs? Wetlands are also defined by their plants. Most plant roots and soil bacteria need oxygen to survive. So in hydric soils, they will quickly die. But not wetland plants. Wetland plants, also called hydrophytes, can survive and grow to limited oxygen in hydric soils. So all wetlands are made up of water, hydric soils, and hydrophytes. But are all wetlands the same? Many people think of wetlands as marshes, but there are actually many other types of wetlands. Some other common types include swamps, bogs, and fens. A marsh is a regularly flooded wetland 
cross stem vegetation. Coastal marshes exist where tidal flooding are called salt marshes. Few plants can tolerate this harsh environment. Salt marsh core grass is one of the most common salt marsh plants. Freshwater marshes have much greater plant diversity. Some of the many plant species found in freshwater marshes include cattails, marsh hibiscus, and pickerel leaves. A swamp is a forest of wetlands of woody plants such as trees and shrubs. Sometimes swamps are completely flooded, but many swamps are often just saturated or muddy. Some of the forested wetlands found in the United States include bald tiger swamps in the southeast coastal plains, mangrove forests along southern Florida and the Gulf Coast, and red maple swamps in the northeast U.S. Bogs are mossy rainwater fed wetlands with a variety of evergreen trees and shrubs. Many other beautiful and interesting plants, such as cranberries, orchids, and even the insect eating Venus flytrap, are found in bogs. Bogs are well known for their spongy soil called peat. Peat forms from partially decayed plants and is common in many wetlands. Sponges are also peat forming wetlands, but they are groundwater fed and look more like meadows with many grasses, trees, and wildflowers. Wetlands were once viewed as stinky insect bitten wastelands, so we now know that wetlands provide many important benefits. Wetlands act as a natural help to provide clean water. They help prevent flooding and maintain river flow. And wetlands provide critical habitat for fish and wildlife, as well as beautiful scenery and opportunities for recreation. Wetlands are able to provide these benefits because of the movement of water to and from the wetlands. Without wetlands or the hydrology that supports them, many of these important ecosystem benefits could be lost. So uh, that was a, a video on YouTube that I will um, be happy to post in, in the chat. I'll grab the link for that so that you all can look over that and, and see that on your own time um, again, uh, especially if the sound was a little low. Um, so you'll be able to go back through that. But let's get back into, um, let's, let's look at my particular favorite wetlands. Um, and so if you're in the Chesapeake Bay, if you're on the mid-Atlantic coast, these are the type of wetlands you are most likely to encounter. Um, so these are salt marshes. And salt marshes are these really, really interesting um, wetlands. So these are the ones that are occurring anywhere that you've got uh, both salt water um, that could be anywhere from full strength seawater. So as salty as when you go to the ocean, um, all the way up to just a little bit of salt. Um, uh, so anything that's not just freshwater um, still uh, counts as a salt marsh um, or a brackish marsh, and, and we've got different types of those. But salt marshes are, um, they exist in the intertidal zone. So every day um, here on the Atlantic coast, the tide goes up and down, and we've got two high tides and two low tides. And so when the water is at its highest, um, so on average, the mean high water, you uh, get this low marsh zone. And so the low marsh zone is the part that is um, underwater at least once a day, uh, or at least twice a day in Virginia. Um, so this is dominated by Spartina alterniflora, or smooth cord grass. And this is a really cool plant. Um, and we'll get, get into that in a little bit about what makes this plant so special. Um, but this is where a lot of the action is happening. So this is the part that's flooded regularly and plants, animals are all moving, or uh, animals are all moving into the grasses during high tide and, and they're eating and um, they're laying eggs and, and it's providing shelter for, for lots of different species. Um, and so that, that low marsh zone is, is really important. But then as you go a little bit higher, um, there are parts of the marsh behind the, that low marsh zone uh, where you start getting other species. You start picking up salt meadow cord grass, so Spartina patens, uh, black needle rush, which is juncus, um, spike grass, Distiglis um, spicata. And, and in that area, that's the part that's um, flooded at least once a month. And so you get, you get these species that are both salt tolerant because the plant needs to be able to tolerate that salt water, but also um, flooding um, tolerant. And so not all species can, can tolerate both, um, but the less frequently that they are underwater um, is, uh, is better for some species than for others. And so you get this, this high marsh zone where you start getting lots more um, 
lots more species, but also a very, very important part of the marsh. Um, and so then as you move upland, that's when you start picking up your marsh elder, your common reed, your, um, and then your other upland plants. These are all plants that, uh, you know, um, those that might be able to tolerate the occasional hurricane um, coming through and dropping some extra water, but definitely can't tolerate those mostly saturated soils. Um, and so that's where we get that upland boundary. But I am, I particularly am interested in the, uh, in those, that low marsh and, and kind of that lower um, high marsh where, where lots of activity is happening on a daily basis. So what are some of the things that live in salt marshes? Um, these are lots of different species. You've got everything from uh, blue crabs and, and other types of crabs, hermit or fiddler crabs, um, uh, other burrowing crabs that live in the marsh itself. Um, blue crabs will move in during the, the high tide and, and look for food. You've also got lots of fish. So here's one of our um, field techs for CCRM and he is um, holding the massive mummy chug um, that he caught. So these are our minnows. If you go to um, any of the bait stores around here and buy minnows, this is probably what you would be buying. Um, but these mummy chugs are really important um, for, for the marsh. They're moving nutrients in and out of the marsh. So they eat in the marsh, they eat in the creeks, and then they're moving those nutrients between them as they, um, as they excrete nutrients or, or they're eaten in one of those locations. Um, so really important there. You've got insects. Um, so for example, the salt marsh skipper is a butterfly that is unique to salt marshes. Um, it, it relies on salt marshes. Uh, and that's, that's fairly uncommon for um, um, a lot of butterflies. You've got turtles. Uh, the diamondback terrapin really relies on, on salt marshes around the East Coast. Birds, uh, lots of wading birds and shorebirds are using this habitat. And then you've also got uh, things like rib mussels. So these are bivalves that burrow down in the marsh um, and do some really cool stuff that we'll talk about in a little bit. So. Speaking of, I'd like to tell you a tale of two species. And, and this tale of two species is something that I'm gonna need you to think about a little bit as we go along. So the two species we're gonna look at are the rib mussel, which is Jukensia demissa, and then the smooth cord grass, which is Spartina alterniflora. So first, uh, plants and salt. Um, how many of you, when you are are home watering your plants. Uh, go and grab the salt shaker and, and put some salt on your plants occasionally, or mix up a nice brine, um, some nice salty water, and pour that on your plants to, to water them and keep them happy and healthy. Um, my guess is, and, and hopefully, <laughs> unless you're growing Spartina alterniflora or, or mangroves, um, my guess is that you never do that. And that's because almost universally, nearly all plants, um, except for things that are called halophytes, are, uh, don't like salt. Um, and they don't like salt enough to avoid it at all costs because a lot of, um, almost any concentration of salt is enough to kill most plants. Um, and so we really don't want to put salt water on plants. Um, and yet, we have places that look like this, where just huge, absolutely dense amounts of plants um, exist in, this, in these salt marshes. And so the question is, how, how are these um, plants doing this? And so one of the really cool things about Spartina alterniflora is that it is very specially adapted to be able to live in those areas um, where it can tolerate salt. It's got some really cool adaptations that let it tolerate both frequent flooding and salt. Interestingly, uh, if you took some Spartina alterniflora, put it in a pot in your backyard and you know, kept, it, um, kept it watered semi-frequently, gave it lots of nutrients, it would grow even better in that pot than it does um, where you'd find it in the wild, down in the low marsh. Um, the difference is that if you then decided to plant that in your backyard and you were like, I'm gonna have a nice um, Spartina alterniflora um, lawn. 
every weed under the sun would come through and outcompete the Spartina alterniflora. It just is not very good at growing um, in those upland conditions compared to all of the other plants that live there. Um, but what makes it unique is that none of the other plants can live where it lives. And so it's managed to, to build a life and eke out, um, eke out a living in that low marsh area. So Spartina alterniflora is super cool. And you're going to find it all up and down the East Coast um, as the primary, primary species um, along low marshes on the East Coast of the United States. So the second one we're going to look at is the rib mussel. Um, so one of the weird things is that you know, here's, a, here's a mussel that lives in the intertidal. Um, and the intertidal means that for at least about half the day, it's out of the water. And so could you imagine, you know, going to the, um, going down to the creek and, and picking up some clams or, or something like that and expecting them to be happy and healthy if you left them out in the sun for half the day. Um, and just it, here's a bivalve though that um, despite this grows in abundance. We see huge numbers of this, um, of mussels along the coast. Um, all tied into this Spartina alterniflora. Uh, and they have some really cool adaptations. And so one of the first questions is, well, why are they there at all? Um, it's like the Spartina. Why is the Spartina in this place where there's salt and there's water? Um, and it's because it, it gives it a place where it can outcompete um, the other plants. And the rib mussels are in a similar situation. They they have adaptations that allow them to live higher in the intertidal than any other um, bivalve species in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, they are specially adapted to this uh, kind of aggregate living. So they live in these clumps like you can see here. Um, and then from the video, one of the things that she mentioned is that marshes stink. And if, if you've ever been to a salt marsh at low tide, or if you've ever driven along the coast um, during low tide, you've noticed it doesn't smell very good. And that's from hydrogen sulfide. Um, and one of the things that uh, is special about hydrogen sulfide, besides the fact that it stinks, is that it's really toxic to anything that tries in, to live in there. So hydrogen sulfide is really bad. And yet rib mussels have this special adaptation where when things get rough, if, if oxygen content drops for some reason, they can actually breathe hydrogen sulfide. So, so here's a species that um, on the outside, looks practically no different than something that you would find at the absolute bottom of the ocean, I mean, down in the deepest, darkest depths of the ocean, um, almost the exact same body plan. And yet they've managed to come up with some very special adaptations that let them live almost anywhere, um, even, even this high up in the intertidal where other things like crabs and predators can only access occasionally. So they, it helps get them up and away from, from predators. So mussels and, and Spartina, two really cool species. And then when they come together, they actually help each other. Um, so if you look at this picture, um, right on the very edge, the mussels are getting a little bit more sun. Um, but as you move back into the marsh, the grass actually starts to shade them. And so the more shade that they have, um, the less water they lose. And so that the grass is helping the mussels. Um, and then, in return, the mussels, as they're filtering out all sorts of stuff that lives in the water and eating it, um, one of the things that they give back is ammonia. And that ammonia is actually fertilizer for the grass. And so the grass then gets nice um, fertilizer and helps the grass grow. And the more the grass grows, the more shade you get. And so it's this nice uh, positive feedback loop called mutualism. And so really cool interaction between these two species along the coast. All of that being said, one of the things that we really need to think about going forward is sea level rise. And so um, if, we, if we go back and, and look at this, sea level rise is, um, is important because remember, all of this exists in the intertidal. So this is stuff that is underwater during every tide. And so when the water comes up, where that tide is and where these plants and animals are in the tide range is going to change. Um, so, these mussels that are living here right now 
um, in a few years are going to be further underwater than they are today. And that means that they're going to be accessible to predators more frequently. Um, the back edge of the marsh is going to be underwater more frequently. So the plants that live back there are going to have to, um, are going to, have to change. And so all of these marshes are, are going to be changing actually fairly rapidly as a result of sea level rise. And so let's just take a look at what sea level rise is going to look like here in the Chesapeake Bay. So I am a fantastic artist. Um, and so I've drawn a, a really um, realistic image of myself, um, as you can see on this slide. And uh, so I'd like you to, to see that I am here on, this, um, on this, this great picture of myself, and I'm at the coastline. This is me in 1994, and we're going to pretend that I was six feet tall, um, my current height, <laughs> um, back in 1994 when I was five years old. And so let's say I, I go down to Norfolk and, and I'm, or Virginia Beach, and I, I stand right where the water is at, um, at mean tide or at high tide. And this, this is where I'm standing. And I, I go right down until the water just barely touches my toe. Um, and so that's where the water was in 1994. And I mark it with an X and or drop a GPS point so that I can go back to that exact same spot. And then um, yesterday, I went back to the exact same spot. And if I stood there today um, at the same part of the tide, uh, the water would be about seven inches higher than it was in 1994. So you can see that now my ankles are getting wet um, and, and maybe the lower part of my leg um, is underwater. So we're definitely seeing, um, seeing a rise there, but, but maybe it's not so bad yet. Um, but let, let's look forward a little bit. What, what are we going to see um, as we go forward? Because sea level is both rising, but it's also rising faster through time. Um, and so, it's not that from it's not that 32 years um, is going to pass and and we're going to see another seven inches um, by 2050, just uh, 29 years from now, we're going to add another um, another foot on top of that. So 1.6 inches or uh, 1.6 feet is where the water will be. So it'll be kind of right at my knees um, in 2050, and then if we look really far forward. Um, let's say I'm 110 or 11 years old. I'm still kicking, doing great. I'm going to go back and stand at that exact same spot. Where will the water be then? At that point, we're looking at four and a half feet um, higher than it is now it is what our best guess is for, um, for 2100. But it could actually be quite a bit higher than that if we don't start slowing down um, our greenhouse gas emissions and the things that are contributing to sea level rise. And so the water is coming up and it's coming up fast. So it's changing the way that we are interacting. Or so, those, um, so the salt marshes that we see are going to have to, to adapt. Um, that intertidal zone is going to shift. And so when the water comes up, we lose wetlands at the very front edge, the part that's closest to the water. Um, and we start squeezing them um, if we run up against something in the back. So normally, uh, the salt marsh could just kind of keep moving back. Uh, let's assume that everything is gently sloped and, and it can move back almost indefinitely. But we know that we're living in a place where we've got houses, we've got roads, we've got banks. Um, and so when the place behind the marsh changes, when that slope increases, the marsh can't move backwards as fast as it erodes on the front edge. And so we get something called coastal squeeze. And this is the process um, combined with just overall drowning of marshes that's likely going to cause the biggest decrease in the amount of marsh that we have in the future. So my work is really focused a lot on um, how do we, one of the ways that we're trying to address that. Um, there's not much that we can do personally to, to change um, the rate of sea level rise besides being better stewards of the environment, using, um, using fewer resources, reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, but when it comes to individual choices, things that we can do along our shoreline are, are choices that we can make. And so one of the things that we can do is install these things called living shorelines. And so people don't 
flake when their property is eroded, when you lose that um, the, the property or your, your yard um, is being washed away every time the waves come. Um, and so people want to protect that. And so typically those protections have come with um, in, a, in a gray format or a hardened shoreline. So things like riprap revetment or bulkhead. Um, these are pictures down here. Um, and these are just hard structures and they do, they, they stop the erosion. Um, but we also know that they're really bad for the environment. They don't support the species that need to live in the inner tidal. So you've taken this nice flat area and shifted it to a perfectly vertical structure in a place where we don't have a big tide range. That means that you're really reducing that inner tidal zone and, and species just can't use it like they can a marsh. Um, so instead, we can create marshes. Um, so we can uh, keep it you know, vegetated only. Um, if you've got very little wave action at your shoreline, you can use um, just, just plantings. Um, or you can do like a little bit of a natural fiber log if you've got a little bit higher energy, but, um, but still not a lot. Uh, a lot of the places around here, um, there's just enough wave energy that you need a little bit more um, structure out front. So you put something like a rock sill. Um, so the same type of stuff that you'd use for a riprap revetment, but you only build it up to a certain height and then you plant a marsh behind it. And this is really, really cool and, and really great. Um, and if you look at it, here's what it would look like um, in real life. So this is what a real living shoreline, um, one of those marsh sills looks like here in Virginia. Uh, and they look beautiful. Um, and we really think that they have a great potential to help um, both reduce erosion and, and provide habitat for species. But we're not positive about that. Um, and so one of the things that we looked at is, let's see, I'm going to skip ahead just a little bit. We looked at whether or not it actually supported all the species that, that you would expect to see in a natural marsh. Um, so we went through and, and did this big comprehensive study of, um, of what did we find. Uh, so we looked at lots of different things. We looked at the soils, we looked at the plants, we looked at um, the animals that live in there, everything from mussels and, and burrowing crabs to fish and birds and turtles. And really what we found is that across the board, it's good for plants, it's good for mussels, it's good for fish, it's good for birds, it's good for terrapins. Um, and the only area that, that it didn't look as good as the natural marshes um, were, the, were the soils. Um, and that's because when we build a living shoreline, it's uh, we use clean sand fill. Um, so we are just putting in plain sand. And that sand just doesn't have the nutrients that you would expect from the mucky, muddy soil that you would get in a, in a marsh. Um, but we did see that it looks like if you give it enough time, those soils are going to look very similar. And so, yeah, it looks like, looks like these living shorelines are going to do a really good job um, and be helpful um, going forward. And so I'm just going to flash this up here for a quick second. If you um, want to learn more about that, uh, we did just publish a paper on it. Um, it's pretty exciting. Uh, five years of work finally <laughs> coming out. Um, you can either you know, follow the link, use your smartphone to scan the, um, scan the QR code, uh, but feel free to go and check that out. It's open access. Anyone can read it. Um, and with that, I will happily uh, take any questions. Thank you so much. That was great. Yeah, so um, if you guys have any questions, again, you can leave it in the Q&A. Um, and I do see we have one question already. Um, so they're asking, how do trees survive on land that are located really close to salt or brackish water? Are they able to adapt at all? Yeah, so it depends on the species. There are, um, so the pines, loblolly pines around here tend to be a little more resilient. Um, they can take the occasional bit of water, um, but if you if you look around the, um, actually I think if you look closely in this photo you can actually see. Um, let me grab the, let me grab the laser pointer. Can you all see this? Yes. Um, so if you look at this section here, you actually see some dead trees, 
uh, that is part of a ghost forest. Um, and so as the water comes up, if they aren't high enough up the bank, they will die. Um, and so you get these places where the trees at the back edge of the marsh um, start to die. And then when they die, those marsh grasses um, that live in the high marsh can then move back into those areas. And so this is that natural process of marsh migration. And as long as you've got those natural areas um, that are nice and flat behind the salt marsh, the salt marsh will keep moving back into there. Um, but as, as long as the plants aren't underwater too frequently, so those trees aren't underwater too frequently, they, they can survive. Um, uh, but it's, it's really a, a matter of time. Um, all of these trees in this photo will probably um, turn into a ghost forest um, in the fairly near future. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then someone else is asking about bulkheads. Is there any kind of, is that a positive method that could be used at all? So from what we've seen, um, uh, all of the studies seem to suggest that bulkheads are really not good for the environment. Um, there are things that you can, so if you already have a bulkhead, um, there are things that you can do to kind of retrofit it, uh, that they're experimenting with it now to try and increase the amount of habitat on those bulkheads, but they are still very, very different than any of the natural habitat that you'd find in the Chesapeake Bay. They just don't support species like a marsh does. Um, and then by, we've also seen that over time, they are less resilient to climate change um, and increasing um, sea level rise. So once those bulkheads do become overtopped, it's easy to scour out behind them. And then you've got to a fairly high replacement cost. Whereas, um, uh, riprap, riprap or, or especially a living shoreline is really designed to kind of help build over time. Um, so those marsh grasses can keep increasing a little bit through time. Um, but the, the actual cost of putting in a living shoreline is just slightly higher depending on where you are. It, it is a, a fairly complex like pricing thing for, for bulkheads or um, living shorelines, but there's less maintenance required over time. Um, and they do provide those same ecosystem services that you just don't get with a bulkhead. Yep. Um, and then we have another question asking about specifically defining what is the Chesapeake Bay dead zone? So uh, the dead zone um, occurs a ways away from the, from the marshes, but they all are kind of interrelated. That's, this is uh, part of the ecosystem of the bay. And so um, dead zones form when you get a whole lot of organic matter um, or nutrients or whatnot that end up in one particular location. And so during the spring, often what happens is you get these big blooms of phytoplankton or algae or, or little photosynthetic organisms that are floating around in the water. Um, and when they die, they float down to the bottom. Um, some of them get eaten along the way, some of them get eaten while they're alive. But if you get too much of that algae, um, that too much of that phytoplankton, which is often a result, um, and especially in the Chesapeake Bay, um, one of the reasons that you get that is we get lots of runoff from the land that brings in lots of extra nutrients. So we call that eutrophication. And that comes from people putting fertilizer on their lawns, um, people using too much, uh, farmers using too much fertilizer on their fields, um, all of those kind of come together where if you've got too much and it runs off into the bay, the algae are happy to, to use those extra nutrients. And so you get lots and lots of, of that algae. Then when it dies and falls down to the bottom because there's more algae than there are things to eat it, um, decomposers start working and decomposition uses oxygen. And so when you've got lots and lots of dead stuff, and lots and lots of decomposers, what ends up happening is you um, use up all the oxygen down at the, the very bottom of the bay. And, and that's how you get a dead zone is, is you've just got lots of space where there's not enough oxygen to support most life. Um, so that, that's where the dead zone comes from. And there are dead zones located, not just in the Chesapeake Bay, but definitely in a lot of locations. Yeah. 
I think the first one that they found and, and realized um, and learned about this process was down in uh, the Gulf. Um, so the Gulf where the uh, Mississippi River flows out, um, goes out past uh, New Orleans. Um, it's dumping tons and tons and tons of nutrients out there. And you actually get this big dead zone that forms just offshore um, from the Mississippi River. Um, and so we have time for one more question. Um, and if you guys have additional questions, um, Dr. Isdell's put his contact information up on the screen. If you want to follow up with him at all, that is totally fine. But our last question for this evening is how and why does sea level rise happen? And I know you kind of touched on this a little bit. Yeah. Um, so I, I talked about what is happening with sea level rise, but not, not why um, the sea level is rising. And so the climate is warming, um, the earth is getting warmer. And so when you think about the oceans and, and all the water that's out there, the oceans don't aren't like a bathtub that has a, a drain in the bottom, um, where if you pull the plug, um, you can let out some water. And so we've got lots of water stored on land in, um, in the ice caps, uh, in glaciers, um, snow melt. So lot, lots of that water is stored on land. Um, and so as the climate warms up and that ice melts, it flows into the oceans. And so the more water you put in, it, it has to go somewhere so that the overall level of the oceans increases. Um, that's the primary way is that, that input of water. Um, and then here, uh, particularly in the Chesapeake Bay, we've got a few um, neat things that are, I say neat, science neat, um, <laughs> maybe not great things that are happening. One of the other things that happens is that as water warms up, it gets, it expands. And so that expansion of water also leads to um, an increase in the sea level. Um, as water, as the climate warms up, and as you in put more fresh water up um, at the poles, what ends up happening is you decrease how quickly um, ocean circulation is happening. And so we've actually just offshore, um, out in the middle of the Atlantic, we've got this big gyre where the water is just kind of turning in this great big circle. It, it's slow, it's not something that you could stand there and, and really watch, but it does happen just fast enough over a big enough area that if you went and sat in the middle of the Atlantic, you'd be a full meter, um, so about three feet higher than if you were sitting on the sea surface um, close to shore. But as, as everything warms up and we're putting in more water, um, that is slowing down, and that process of slowing it down means that they're going to start balancing out. Um, and so we can add a full um, foot and a half of water just from slowing down to stopping that, that process. Um, and then locally, we have something, um, you know, global sea level rise is happening. The, the overall rate is, is coming up, but locally is what we really care about. And those local factors also include things like land subsidence. And so um, in addition to the water coming up around here locally, the land is also falling. And so it makes it look like the water is coming up faster relative to um, global sea level rise, which is why here in Virginia, we're already over um, five millimeters per year, which is second highest in the country. Um, only, only Louisiana is uh, coming up faster. Great. Well, we just want to thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening and being our guest speaker and giving a great introduction about what wetlands are and some of the threats they face, but also why they're so critical and important for our ecosystem, especially since a lot of folks here are local. Um, so again, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, and thank you guys for thank asking those questions. Yeah, it's great to be here. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And so um, I will go ahead and turn it over. We're going to be playing a little bit of a game this evening um, called Wetland Who. Um, and so I'll explain this game a little bit for you guys. Um, it is geared more a little towards uh, younger ages, but feel free to join. Um, so the objective of this game is you are going to try and guess which wetland animal I am describing using the least amount of clues. So I'm going to give you one clue at the beginning. And there's going to be a word bank at the bottom of the screen with a lot of different animals that are found in wetlands. And so 
using that one clue, you're going to try and guess what animal it is. If you're stumped and not sure, I'll show you another clue. You can try and guess. If you're not sure, I'll show you a third clue and then eventually a fourth clue. Um, and I'll show you four animals in total. And the objective of the game is you guys want to accumulate the most amount of points. So if you get it right on the first clue, you get four points. Two clues, you get three points. Three clues, you get two. And four clues, you get one point. Um, so you might want a scrap sheet of paper right next to you to keep track of your points, since we're not going to be able to do that. Um, just for those four rounds, keeping track of how many clues that you used for, for each of those animals. Um, and so with that, I'm going to go ahead and we're gonna start with our first animal. So here on the screen at the bottom, you guys should see uh, who am I? So this is your word bank of various animals. And your first clue of this animal is when threatened, I open my mouth very wide. So I made the first clues a little tough for you guys, but if you want to guess in the chat, you totally can. If you want to not give it away for other people, kind of talk amongst your uh, your family or your peers or try to take a, a stab in the dark yourself about what animal is threatened. When they're threatened, they open their mouth very wide. We have some people taking some guesses already. I like to see that. Cottonmouth alligator, nice. Cottonmouth maybe, okay. I'm seeing a lot of cottonmouth and alligator. So I'm gonna go ahead and give you guys the second clue. I love to hang out in the water and on land. So with that, if you think you know what it is, you don't need that second clue, great. But that is your second clue. Your third clue is, although I am fast, I have no legs. So I don't know if that's changed what you think in the beginning or if you're still on the right track. That's your third clue. And then your final clue for this animal is I am venomous, beware. So I'm seeing in the chat a lot of cottonmouth, some, we saw some alligator spoonbill maybe. The correct answer is a cottonmouth, yes. So sometimes called a water moccasin, they open their mouth very wide when they're threatened. I believe that's where they get their name from because they have a nice white mouth, looks like cotton, um, but they are a very venomous snake that are found in a lot of um, wetlands. So good job for those who got it. Again, if you had, uh, one clue and you got it right, you get four points. Two clues is three points. Three clues is two. And then four clues is one point. And so we're going to move on to our second animal, same word bank. First clue, my favorite meal are fish. Someone was quick. They thought they, they guessed pelican. Maybe great blue heron, maybe. So my favorite meal are fish. Could be a lot of them down there. So clue number two, I'm not afraid of heights. Sometimes you can find me in trees over a hundred feet high. That's pretty high. So what, what animal do you guys think? If it's the same as your first clue, great. I'm seeing a, a mix of different, different birds. I like to see that. Clue number three, I am found all over North America. Probably not the most helpful clue, but probably a good clue that they're a very abundant animal found in a lot of area. And then finally, clue number four, probably gonna give it away here. My namesake is related to my color. So again, in the chat, I saw a lot of people guessing. Um, I think Great Blue Heron was the number one 
option I saw, and you guys are correct, it is a great blue heron. We see them, um, especially locally, you'll find them. Um, they use those stilt-like legs to wade through the marsh and use that long beak that they have to catch fish and smaller animals. So, um, and they do have almost a blue tint to their feathers during some of the time of the year. So good job, guys. Like to see that. And then on to our third animal. The first clue is I have dense, oily fur. So what animal do you guys think has dense, oily fur? Wow, it looks like a lot of people like beaver, okay. Clue number two. I sink green branches into my pond to, to, sorry, to retrieve in winter for food. Still seeing a lot of people guessing beaver, okay. Clue number three, I use my wide tail as a paddle. Might give it away there a little bit, any guesses? We're sticking with beaver, I like to see it. And then finally, clue number four, I build my home in the water with sticks. So I see a lot of people guess, pretty much everyone guessed beaver. And I'm glad that you guys did because it is in fact a beaver. Um, so they are not really an animal you think of a lot of times when you think of wetlands or, or marshes or estuaries. Um, but again, remember wetlands, are just areas that are periodically submerged by water. So beavers are definitely a common species that are found there. Um, so I'm glad to see you guys got that one correct. Again, if you guess on the first clue, you get the most amount of points. And so we're gonna move on to our last animal. First clue, my eyes are located on top of my head. Any guesses what this animal might be? Might be a little trickier than that beaver question. We have some people guessing alligator, fiddler crab, okay, bog turtle. Okay, so we're getting a lot of different, different answers here, which I like to see. So. We'll see if clue number two is a little bit easier. Sometimes I dig a mud den in order to survive droughts. So if your answers stay the same, great. Or if you think you need to change it at all. Someone just entered alligator, okay. Fiddler maybe. Some people are changing, flip-flopping, oh boy. And then clue number three, I am the largest reptile in North America. What animal are we talking about, guys? Okay, and so the final question, or sorry, final clue, I have tough skin, quite literally tough skin. So we see some people entering now alligator perhaps. And I think clue number three might've given away there. So yes, we are talking about the American alligator um, can be very common, especially in um, areas south of here. So they do have those eyes on top of their head. And they do sometimes dig those mud dens in riverbanks or in, in estuarine environments. So a pretty common species that we do see. Um, if you ever get the opportunity to see one, of course, keep your distance. Um, but I've seen them a lot and they are quite an animal to see when you get to see them in person. And so if you guys in the chat wanna let us know how you did, so again, if you guessed one clue for each, you got four points. If you got two clues, 
you got three points. For three clues, you get two points. And for four clues, you get one point. Nice, guys. We got some good, good people getting some high points there. Nice. Try not to make it too tough, but um, this is definitely a really fun game that you guys can play. You can pick your own animals and maybe quiz your siblings and make up your own clues. So it's definitely, definitely something you guys can do at home. So I'm glad you guys got some good points up in there. And so with that, I am going to round up our discovery lab with everyone's favorite. We are going to be playing Kahoot trivia. So I'm gonna pull it up in just a moment here and I'll share it on the screen. And um, for those of you who have not played Kahoot before, I will give you guys a little introduction of how this game works. I'm gonna turn down the music just a little. So if you not, if you haven't played Kahoot before, um, you guys will need a smartphone or you can open it up on another computer screen. You'll wanna go to kahoot.it and it's gonna ask you to enter a game pin, which is located on my screen here. So it's 2000429. And then you'll enter your name or your family's name and you should see your name pop up on my screen. So I see Matt's popped up here, which is great. And how Kahoot works is um, on my screen, there will be a question that pops up. It will be either multiple choice or true or false. And the objective of the game is of course to get it correct, but you also get more points if you answer quickly and get it correct. So it is a timed thing. Um, and also getting it correct, you'll get more points that way. Um, on your smartphone or whatever device you're using to play, you will see the answer choices pop up on your phone. Um, but you'll wanna keep my screen open so you see the question and you see the answer options, but you will answer on your phone and it'll tell you if you got it correct or not. Um, so that's how that this game works. So again, if you guys want to go ahead and enter your name and we'll go ahead and get started. So I'll give you guys another about 30 seconds to get logged in. And you can play as a team if you want, if you're at home, you can go head to head with your family members. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with our first question. True or false? Wetlands can be freshwater, saltwater, and or brackish. Nice, yes, so wetlands can be freshwater wetlands, they can be saltwater, or they can be brackish where you have a mixture of fresh and salt water. Um, so we're not just talking about estuaries, we're talking about all wetlands. So great job guys. And we'll see who's taking the lead here. So we have Wyatt, nice job. And we'll go ahead and move on to our next question, which is multiple choice. What is the largest estuary in the United States? So estuary. So it is the Chesapeake Bay. We're being a little biased here. We are located in the Chesapeake Bay, but it is the largest estuary in the United States. We'll see how our points have changed. We have a little change in the leaderboard, but it's definitely a tight race so far. And our next question, which of the following is a type of wetland? So all of the above are types of wetlands. So any of these areas that are submerged or part of, uh, seasonally submerged, they are qualified to be a wetland. Um, there's a lot more than just these lakes, mangroves, and bogs out there. 
And we have, nice job, Wyatt's on a streak. We have Matt in the lead. Next answer is uh, true or false. Is this a male blue crab? I know we didn't talk about this, but see if you guys can guess it. So that is a female blue crab. Um, so on their belly, their apron, a female has a kind of capital building shape very wide. Um, a male blue crab's apron is going to look kind of like the Washington Monument, very narrow um, and long. So that image was actually a female blue crab. Nice job, guys. Still a tight race, though. Next question is name this bird. Pictured here, what is this bird? Nice job. And that was like a very, you guys answered that very quickly. Yes, that is an offspray, very common um, bird of prey that we see here with their large talons, great fishermen, fisher birds. So we see them a lot. And on to the next question. Which of the following is a wetland function? Nice, yes. So all of these are types of wetland functions. They act as filters and they filter out nutrients and pollutants. Um, they can help protect the shoreline from erosion by buffering it, especially during storms. And they act as a nursery for a lot of species that grow up in, in those areas. So all of these are very critical functions of our wetlands. And I believe we have two questions left. Wetland soils are what type? Yeah, so this one was a little tricky. So if you recall from um, the presentation in that video, they have hydric soil. So fun fact, every state has a soil, a state soil. So the other three options were ones I randomly pulled from states, um, but hydric soil are considered wetland soils. Nice job, guys. And we have one more question. Where is the largest wetland in the world? Wetland in the world. So, fun fact here, <laughs> and I know someone out there might get me on this. Um, I'm said it was Antarctica, which might be confusing to a lot of people. Um, if you research it online, it is a highly debated topic if Antarctica is the largest wetland in the world or not. Um, the reasoning is a wetland, as we've talked about, is an area of land that's submerged with water sometimes. Antarctica, when you go there, you just see ice, right? But they say that researchers say underneath all that ice, is a wetland. Even though it might not be right at the surface, there is a wetland there. So I just thought it'd be kind of a fun little piece of trivia. And if you guys definitely want to research it, I thought it was very interesting. It's something I learned, but um, a lot of researchers and scientists are very split if it's not, it's the only area in the world without wetlands or it is the largest wetland. So personally, I think I'll consider it a wetland, but I would love for you guys to, to research it yourself. And we'll check out our podium. We have in third place, Wyatt, nice job. Maggie and Claire in second. And then in first place, we have Matt. So well done, guys. I love that you guys participated in our wetlands trivia, threw in some tricky questions for you guys there, but I'm definitely glad um, you guys were able to get the majority of those questions right. So um, definitely happy to see that. And if you want to keep researching about Antarctica, feel free. Um, but with that, I does conclude our August, I almost said April, our August 
virtual discovery lab. Again, we will be hosting another one in September. And um, if you follow us on our social media, we'll be advertising for that and putting up the registration link. Uh, if you guys have any questions, um, if you need to contact Sarah or myself about those discovery labs, feel free. Um, and again, you have his email. If you have any questions for Dr. Isdell that you weren't able to ask today, feel free to shoot him an email and he'll definitely reply. But I wanna thank you guys so much for joining us this evening and I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Hopefully it stays, stays dry here. It's been raining a lot. But with that, I wanna thank you guys and I hope you have a great evening.